I'm here today with the great David DeWolf, who founded Three Pillar Global, which he led as CEO for more than 16 years, and which he helped grow from zero to more than 2,200 team members and had a presence in more than 10 countries, or maybe it was just 10 countries, exactly. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. We're going to hear all about his journey in business before and after Three Pillar Global and see what he's up to now. David, thank you so much for joining us on Road to CEO. Hey, well, it's so great to be here. Uh, thanks so much for that intro, and I uh, can't wait for the conversation. Well, let's start at the beginning. Why, why don't you tell yep. us uh, about Three Pillar Global? What kind of business is it? Yeah, so Three Pillars in the product development space. Um, so what what we do is build digital software products for media, information, technology, uh, financial services organizations that are really looking to compete in this digital economy. Um, and the story starts all the way back. I was actually a software engineer. And um, decided back in, gosh, it was 2006 that I was going to be an independent consultant and started consulting with organizations. And I, to be honest with you, don't remember hiring my first employee. I woke up one day about two years later and I had six people. And I'll never forget the day kind of driving down the highway. I was going to visit a, a client and for some reason that day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. What are you doing? You've got six people working for you. And uh, what had happened was we started growing. There was more demand that I could handle than just myself. And I started introducing different clients to friends. And one of them came back to me and said, well, what do you want for Bob? And I said, I don't want anything for Bob. And uh, they said, no, 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 we'd love for you to be part of the relationship, even if it's just a little bit on the side every now and then, you know, help it out. We love Bob, but we'd like you to be involved. And that was how I started growing the company. And it was at this point with six folks that I realized that we had built a brand reputation, not just for being great software engineers, but for being great at product. And the difference between a generic software and a product is that it's got to resonate in the market. It has to sell, right? There has to be customer domain. You have to delight a customer. And so that product mindset was really at the essence of what made us different and began to build a business that candidly, I wasn't smart enough to think about and, and to imagine it just kind of happened to me. Um, and so it was just a phenomenal ride for 16 years, kind of riding that wave and learning how to build and grow a business, learning how to refine strategy, take it to the next level, how to surround yourself with people that are greater than yourself and smarter than yourself and have better experiences than yourself and all of those types of fun things. So it was just a great ride. That's really interesting. So that that is something where we're we're we our paths diverge on. So I totally remember hiring my first employee, <laughs> and it was a really a, a huge moment for me. And um and 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 you know it it really it's you know there were a lot of problems that I needed solved, and that person solved a ton of those problems, and it was just a it was a big watershed moment. So it sounds like for you, you grew out of revenue, and mm -hmm. your first hires were you know they maybe weren't stressful because you knew exactly what they, they were almost weren't hires. They were, they were people you were, you know, you were, you were putting on client accounts and, uh, yep. uh yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I wrote code for the first two plus years. And so even with six employees, it was just literally six of us writing code together. Right. And, and we had a couple of different clients and I was barely involved in one much more in another, but it was very much just this organic thing of seeing the demand in the market and really just trying to solve problems for my clients and um, literally started introducing people. Uh, and, and all of a sudden it just started to grow, but ultimately we realized we had something special. Right. And I think it was that, that was the thing with that aha moment was I had a decision to make. Did I want to go back and tell these six people, listen, I don't know what you've done. I don't know what I've done, but when this project is over, you know, we need to all go find jobs. I said, no, actually, I think we can build something great here. And the market speaking and pulling us to that point, I think gave me the confidence to say, you know, we've got something here. And then I was able to find some mentors to really help me shape and advance that thinking and learn um, to grow as a leader. Because I, I think that's one of the things about being an entrepreneur you realize that through these phases, you have to reinvent yourself about every single year and a half, right? I found over and over again, I had to go from, you know, first being the producer to then being the manager, to then being the sales, uh, and then being a leader, and then an executive, all of these different phases. And I think that was the beginning of that journey of maturation. 
So do you recall when you stopped working on client accounts and you you had to yeah. focus purely on the business side? Yeah, it was 2009. Um, we got to a point where I made a very deliberate decision. It was probably one of the harder decisions that I've made. Um, I loved software engineering. I loved the the craft of building something out of nothing, solving problems with technology. Um, I'm a builder. I'm a creator. And so that was hard uh, to decide to put the keyboard down. Uh, but it was a deliberate decision. And what I realized was that my gift was never being the best computer scientist in the room. I wasn't. I, I In fact, I didn't even study uh, computer science. I, I fell into software and had some great mentors. My gift was being able to understand the business, envision a future, and rally people in order to go build that and to create it. And I loved working in high-performing teams and gathering people to, uh, to aspire towards something, to envision something, and then execute on it. And I realized that building a business, I could do that at a totally different level than I could as a software engineer, even an engineer that was leading that team. Uh, and that's what excited me and, and motivated me to put the keyboard down. So what was the secret sauce early on? Uh, you know, and, and for me, I've got a lot of interest in professional services businesses, technology mm -hmm. services businesses, businesses where you've got to rally a team towards an objective. You know, those mm -hmm. are complicated. That's a complicated yeah. challenge. So how how did you get your team aligned with your vision for that kind yeah. of service? You know, I, I'll be honest. I think in those early days, I think I was just unconsciously competent, right? Um, I've, I've always been a decent communicator. I think that helps. I've always been able to see around corners and imagine a future that other people can't imagine. You put that together, right? I was coming up with vision. I was communicating that. I think accidentally I was able to kind of rally towards that. But as part of that journey of advancing in my career, I had to learn how to systematize that. I had to learn what is it that I'm doing and how do I make sure I do that more repeatedly? Because as you lead more and more, what you realize is you only get work done through other people. And then you get work done through other people who get it done through other people, right? And that abstractness makes it more difficult. And I think it's one of the complexities of building a professional services firm. Um, and so over time, I began to build methodologies, right? And I, I think one of the things that by the end of my run after 16 years of Three Pillar, I actually took the first half of this year and I stepped back and just said, what did I learn? How would I compile all of that? I think I have uh, in my mind uh, a way that I, I was able to write down to actually run businesses and do this. And I, I would say that you can really simplify business, right? On one level, the basis of all businesses is the ideology of the organization. What do you believe in and where are you going, right? It's the aspirational part, but it has to be real. And, you know, go back unconsciously competent. I've always cared passionately about why I'm doing the work. I've always cared passionately about the values of an organization. Those types of things matter. And I would encourage entrepreneurs to really get serious about your ideology. If you don't have a fundamental purpose of why do we exist? If you don't have values, the behaviors with which we interact with each other and, and what it feels like to work at this business. And if you don't have a vision of where you're going, if you can't paint in vivid color, what it's going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, and how you fit in the world, then I don't think you have the basis of a ideology that can really help you do that and pull that team together. So that's that's the first level, that, that first altitude, right? It's the 50,000 foot view um, is that ideology. The next level down is strategy. And strategy is all about how are we going to compete in a market? And specifically, how do we compete for profits? And when you really study strategy, right? A lot of people use the word strategy to mean a big, important decision, right? Strategy is really trade-off decisions that you make in order to differentiate yourself from your competition, right? That's the essence of strategy. So what is your unrivaled capability? What are you investing in and monetizing as a business. And you should have the focus of one thing that we're better than anybody else in the world at. And then you should be able to take that and commercialize it and differentiate it from other competitors. So how is that capability different? Where do you invest in areas that others don't? And if you're able to create a strategy like that, 
What it does is it empowers individuals to make decisions. And I think empowerment is a very key part of how you motivate and inspire people, right? People are drawn to being able to have autonomy over their work. And if you can give them the principles for here's what this organization is and where we're going and the strategy, how we're going to get there, then they can make those day-to-day decisions, right? And so strategy is the next level. Then you have your operating system. What are the processes to get work done, all that type of thing? Um, And then you have your management system. How do we drive momentum of the business? What's our meeting cadence, our reporting cadence, all those types of things. So to me, those are the four altitudes of business, ideology, strategy, operating system, management system that everybody should be using at different levels throughout the entire journey um, of a business. So, and it sounds like some of this came kind of naturally to you. You kind of had a natural understanding that this would be, you know. Yeah, you know, I think certain aspects, and I think everybody has their own gift, right? So for me, what comes naturally for me is the ideology and the strategy. Um, the, The operating system, right? Systems and processes aren't necessarily my strength and my gift. I have to hire people that compliment me to put that together, right? Um, The management system, there's absolutely part of it that is me. Uh, At the same time, I'm not a run operator, which is what management is all about. And so that part doesn't come naturally to me. Um, So um, that aspect I had to work on, I had to grow on, I'm always working on how do I get, how do I tailor my own job to my strengths? And how do I work on my weaknesses, right, to make sure that I'm meeting the bar and then surrounding myself with people that compliment me? Yeah, I I relate to that really strongly. I hired, um, uh, well, I brought on someone who became a business partner, you know, after after some years, you know, fantastic partner, um, compliments, you know, my strengths and weaknesses Mm -hmm. really well. And he's he's a real operating executive. You know, he has, you know, that's not my role. You know, um, you know, I have other strengths. He, you know, I think really critical to bring in people who are better than you in certain areas and and, you know, I think that that was something that I certainly I certainly wanted. Did you so and I want to get into your international expansion at, before, sure. oh, and, and but, but before that, I, I want to ask. So uh, over the course of 16 years, you know, I've experienced that business can go on. It'll be on track for a while. Maybe it'll fall off track. It'll be going fantastically well. And then and then at other times, it just kind of goes off track in certain ways. Did this type of thing ever go off track in a way that required a serious reset where you had to say, okay, the strategy mm. needs to be, you know, maybe the, the morale needs to be uh, improved at the company. There's some, you know, the strategy is unclear suddenly, or, or people yeah. don't understand what the vision is anymore. You know, did that has, did that come up, uh, come up during your, your journey here? Yeah, you know, you you can answer that question in so many different ways. Um, you know, on one hand, we were very fortunate. We grew all 16 years. Um, and, um, you know, typically, I think there was one year of 9% growth and everything else was double digit growth, right? So uh, I want to say, hey, in that regard, you could say no, but the reality, yes, like that... Th- what people forget is that business is not up and to the right. It is a roller coaster. And even if you're able to step back and look at the big picture of, oh, wow, yeah, three pillar grew every single year, double digits year over year over year for 16 years, that sounds good, but you lose the real roller coaster of that. So l- let me point out a couple of different instances, uh, just stories that I love. Um, Early on, I think this was about three to four years in. Um, we came within six hours of missing payroll. Um, we actually had our very first client, um, was a client for a very long time. Um, we had just about the week before, um, sold a new client that brought them down to 50% of our revenue and they got acquired. And then again, a month and a half later, the company that acquired them acquired them. And we ended up losing the client for a short period of time because of that. They ended up coming back later. But when we lost them, I had a month of time to sprint and figure out how do we fund payroll and uh, to get people busy. Ended up finding an incredible mentor that helped me learn how to sell really for the first time, as opposed to just allowing people to buy from me and um, was able to go get a client who was willing to give us a prepayment, a deposit in exchange for a discount. And that covered payroll. Um, Came literally within six hours and whoo, I lost some sleep over that one, right? So that's a great example. Um, I still remember the first time 
uh, an employee ever resigned. That was a hard moment for me and an emotional moment. We made an acquisition uh, in 2009. And in that, I thought I was doing the right thing by sitting down and kind of re-looking at our ideology and recrafting the values of the organization to bring these two organizations together. Because we were really almost mergers of equals, even though we had acquired them. And I tried to do it out of respect and honor for the other, other business and their founders, but realized that because of that, we had compromised our values. And about two years later, I had to reset them because we weren't living them because we had these two sets of things that didn't really resonate with anybody. And I wasn't passionate about, and so I couldn't lead them. So I had to do a hard reset on the ideology of the business and say, you know what, we're going to go back to square one. Let's define really what our values are and do that reset. Um, so there were instances like that over and over again. And I, I think so often people like to talk about their successes, right? It's, it's easy for me to come on here and say for 16 years, I grew double digits, right? The reality is that's not everybody's real experience. There's ups and downs along the way. There's, there's mistakes you made. There are clients that we lost. There's, um, you know, reasons that I did that. Um, and, and I, I made mistakes along the way. And, and so those are just a couple of the examples, but I think the experience is littered with them. Yeah. So th yeah, those are all really interesting examples. Let, let's talk about, um, how you decided to expand your team internationally. As I understand yeah. you hire, you, you started off perhaps going into Romania, maybe was that the, yeah. the first company? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So we, you know, remember the genesis of the company, right? I was an independent consultant. Uh, I was writing code. To, this is really funny, but for the first two years of the business, I actually sold against everything offshore. You know, my whole sales pitch was, um, if it costs one third the price, but it takes four times uh, the amount of time, you are still paying more, right? And um, it worked for about two years. Um, and then what was really interesting, I had a CFO that came to me, was the CFO of our very first client. And he said, David, the exact entire executive team over here loves you guys. You guys are rapid time to market, high quality software. The innovation you're helping us with is breakthrough. He's like, I got to be honest. They love you. I'm struggling with you. And I'm going to tell you why. And he said, if you listen to me, I think you're going to build a great business. He's like, if you don't, I want to keep you around, but I can't. He said, here's the problem is You've got the value proposition, but what you don't fundamentally understand about software products is that when this is your product, it is never done. You're not coming in here to do a project. You have to innovate continuously and continue to put software out. He said, you're coming in and doing projects for us. You're going away. My employees take it over. Everything goes downhill. I have to call you back in. He said, it's too expensive. I can't pay you 250 bucks an hour um, in order to do that. You've got to figure out a way. How do you deliver that value proposition in a way that it's sustainable for me and I can keep you around forever? He said, if you do that, it's great for you because not only will you continue to have work from us, it won't be episodic. It won't be project-based work. I'll keep you around forever but it will be at a price point that's sustainable. And he said, listen, I have failed multiple times offshoring things and doing the cheap business model. I don't need cost arbitrage. What I need is sustainable innovation. And that was the impetus for us. I was like, that's a really fascinating idea. And what was, was interesting at that time, I was doing a lot of work in the open source software world. And in that world, I was collaborating with global engineers all over the globe that I'd never even met in person. And, um, they, it was the best software engineering teams I'd ever worked on in my life. Like we were building world-class software, like literally at the time, Apache Struts was in all of the Fortune 500 companies, I was writing this code with other engineers around the world. And I was like, why couldn't I apply that model here? And so I went around and I started interviewing different executives at different firms, looking for companies to partner with, figuring out like, how do I cobble that together? And I sat down for breakfast one day with the CEO of a business who had the exact opposite business model that we did. They had about a team of 20, 25 in Romania. They had four or five people here locally in Virginia, right down the road from me that were SG&A. And the comment that the CEO said was, our business is being commoditized. People are just looking at us as cheap labor. I have got to figure out how do I instill a value proposition? And what I heard was, hand in glove, right? The exact opposite. And so we ended up starting to go to market together. And for 
I can't remember. It was probably 14, 16 months. We started going to market together and seeing, can I cross sell them? Can they bring me into accounts? And the value proposition we came up with started to resonate. And we started to be beat much larger organizations, well-regarded organizations, in competitive processes. Um, and we started to win major accounts. We won um, PBS, became a client. We build all of their digital media to this day. And we started that as a relationship of two partners coming together to have a unique value proposition. And after doing that for over a year, it hit me, this is an amazing business and there's a unique thing here. And we ended up acquiring them. Um, and that was the beginning of the journey to build um, what we called globally distributed teams and this innovation as a service offering that was quite differentiated in the space at that time. That's fascinating. So then do you did you continue to run the 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 business unit in Romania as an independent company or was it or did you did you merge it and everybody is the same three pillar global you know employees and you know they're, yeah. they're integrated into the culture and all of that. Yeah, no, we we strongly believe in an integrated business. Um, it's really hard to to run different businesses and call them the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot, did several acquisitions over the years. Um, but it, that first one in Romania, we immediately put together because it was really two businesses coming together to create something new. And that was the beginning of the ride. And we we did some acquisitions where, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I made uh, was one acquisition I let hang out there for over 18 months and it was just too long. I had another one that I crammed together too fast, right? You, you learn over time. Um, but we really believe fundamentally at the end of the day, um, there's a hashtag at three pillar that goes around one team. Hashtag one team, we're one team. And that means not only across the globe, but across departments, across functions, across every aspect of the business we operate as one. Um, and so we would bring everybody under the umbrella. So then did, was your international uh, growth, was it fueled through this type of acquisition again and again, or did you organically grow? It was uh, both. As well? Yeah, we did a little bit of both. So we started off in Romania um, as when we acquired this company in Romania, they were small enough that they had a partner they were using that when they had more work than they could handle, they had overflow capacity that was going to India. And uh, after about a couple of years of running that way, we went to that company and said, hey, listen, we need to wind this down. We need everything under one team, one roof. And and that business said, you know, uh, it's funny, you're 20% of our revenue, that's going to hurt. And we were about to sell the business. Would you consider buying the business? Um, and so we ended up buying that business and uh, that was a great thing. And then for, gosh, that was in 2011. From 2011 to 2020, it was all organic growth. And um, we did go to several new countries uh, organically. Um, sometimes that was very successful. Um, sometimes we stubbed our toe and it didn't work out. Um, so we've had to pull the plug. Uh, and then we became acquisitive again in 2020 and started uh, to do more of it, kind of building on the platform that we had created. I, I promise I want to talk about some of your successes, but um, but tell me about <laughs> some of the times you've stubbed your toe. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. the one I was just referring to, um, gosh, it was probably 2012 or 2013. Uh, we heard a market signal. Customers were asking for nearshore, not offshore in our global delivery model. Now, what was interesting about that was ultimately we were selling three pillar. We weren't selling the countries we were in, but about 25% of our customers were what we called educated buyers. They were heads of engineering that had outsourced before. They knew things about the different countries. They wanted to mm. send things one place or another. Um, and so we thought that was a market signal and we went and opened up in Argentina. Well, we were able to grow our Argentinian delivery center to about 30, 35 people. But then we found something really fascinating. People said they wanted a nearshore option, but when you actually gave those educated buyers an option, they would choose the reputation of Eastern European engineering over the convenience of nearshore all day long. And so while they said they wanted it, they wouldn't choose it. And then on top of that challenge of scaling that operation, 
we also hit a huge, the Argentinian economy is a hard one and the inflation was brutal. And so um, our costs were just going up and up and up. And I probably stayed there too long. But after, if I remember correctly, three or four years, we ended up pulling the plug and getting out of there. So there, that was one that, uh, you know, not only did I not hear the market signals the right way, but I stayed there too long trying to make it work and not wanting to, to pull the plug too soon. Um, I think both of those were mistakes. That's very interesting. Yeah, um, I think it's it's also interesting to me that 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 it was more about the market and the customers and less about the culture of the different countries that you, that you were in. So yeah. it sounds like um, it, it, so so. Well, actually, let me maybe phrase it like this: Do you feel like if the market is right, you you know you can plant uh, a, make a new office in almost any country, or do you do there have to be some cultural conditions that also overlap? Yeah. Um, I would say broadly speaking, I do believe that. Um, I believe human beings are human beings. And, um, you know, I think we make way too much of the cultural differences sometimes and we ignore the cultural similarities. I found especially, you know, at, at, at Three Pillar, we were all about building software products and, and product development is a craft um, there's multiple crafts actually that go into it, right? There's user experience and design, and that's a craft and engineering is a craft. And like, we have all of these different crafts, um, crafts, people actually respect other crafts, people. And if you focus on the similarities of the craft, it's amazing what happens. I think too often people focus on the differences. They point out the differences and they don't respect the difference. They just point them out. Um, and I found over and over again that absolutely, like we were in Romania, Moldova, Czech Republic, um, India, Guatemala, Mexico, um, Costa Rica, Canada, and the United States, right? Uh, uh, yes, all of those countries work well together. It doesn't mean that you ignore and say, oh, you know, the... Costa Rican culture doesn't matter. No, you you respect it. You honor it. But what you put front and center is not the difference and the different way that they have a, a holiday party that's different from the way you do it in Romania. What you put at the center of the conversation is what we share in common. And what we shared at, in common at Three Pillar was our values. What we shared in common at Three Pillar was a love for craft and building product, right? All of those things. And by putting that front and center, it brought people together as opposed to dividing them and pushing them apart. So um, in terms of managing the company, do you have senior leaders across all different countries or are or is it, or is it more of a hierarchical thing where you've got the senior management in the US and then and then you know other types of jobs you know engineering jobs and development jobs etc that are that are abroad how, can you talk yeah. about kind of how you structured it from that standpoint yeah, I mean, here's the reality. As you grow and scale an organization, you go through different phases and there are different ways. There's no right or wrong. Um, we found, go back to one team. We found the most powerful thing was to have one team. Um, we did not structure by geography. We absolutely had senior people in all geographies and in different ones at different levels, right? Um, but we were functionally aligned and organizing around what we wanted to accomplish right? The way we were doing work was more important than the geographic boundaries. Um, our business was not like, you know, running local restaurants where there are autonomous units. We needed the cross-functional integration and the collaboration. And so that that's most of the time how we ran it, but there were definitely different seasons. And even now, um, since my departure, you know, there's, there's different changes going on because it's the next phase and all of that type of thing. So I'm, I'm able to now watch that from the board level and it's fun and exciting uh, to watch and, and see the evolution. So what was your goal when you first found yourself in business? You know, you or maybe even take a step back before then. I mean, you know, it sounds like things unfolded in a very organic way. Did you, in the back of your mind, before you started Three Pillar Global, did you think you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Did you want to, to run a company like this? Yeah, you know, looking back on my life, I, I see those signs where, wow, I did have it in me. Um, I'll say I wasn't co cognizant of it, right? I wasn't thinking about it necessarily. Um, I definitely made a deliberate decision to be an independent consultant. Mm -hmm. I think once I hit that point of, whoa, there's something here, um, I was able to see how the market was going to evolve and said, hey, yeah, we want to build the most respected company in this space, right? Um, 
you know, your your first question as you started that was about what, what was the goal? To be honest with you, it was always about building a great business, right? I'm a true believer in that. And in that, for me, what really motivated me was I wanted to live an integrated life. I wanted to be exceptional in my career and professionally and do great work, but I wanted to at the same time be an awesome husband and father. And I've got eight kids um, and to live that way day in and day out, I wanted to create a, a specific culture and experience that everybody was able to do that. And so we had a culture where it was not unusual um, for you to see my kid in the office because we were about to do a carpool to a baseball practice at three o'clock in the afternoon, right? That type of thing. And so we had a very flexible culture before COVID even happened, right? And um, you could show up on a, a video conference with, uh, you know, one of your kids in the room. That was okay. We said, we want you to be the best mother in the world in addition to being the best professional in the world. And we're going to help you and support you in that. So that was also part of my my the impetus uh, for really deciding to double down on this is I had never seen that in my career before. Right? I tended to step back and look at people I looked up to, and they were either awesome professionals or awesome fathers. They weren't both very often. Um, and so I really wanted to create a culture where we could be the best version of ourselves and not have to separate the different components of us. Um, and so building that type of culture, building, and that that included being the best in business, right? We built a company that was on the Inc. 500 10, 10 years out of 11, right? Um, that type of thing. We sold the business twice to private equity, incredibly successful runs. Like we were able to do something great as a team, but we did it without sabotaging other parts of our lives. And that was a really critical component of it. The goal was never to make a lot of money or to have an exit strategy. I told people all the time, if you're coming here because you want an exit strategy, you're coming to the wrong place. I believe if you build a great business, then all the options in the world are open to you. A sale, an IPO, and all of those types of things, those are financing strategies. That's how you accomplish your vision. That's not the goal itself. Um, and that's the approach that we always took. So how did you think about financing? Because you did take on private equity, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how did you how did you decide to do that? How did you, you know, how, how did you decide to make that a part of your growth strategy? Yeah. So I would say it was a financing strategy. It was about how do we, um, first it became about how do we achieve the vision, right? The vision was first and foremost. And we really wanted to reinvent the product development space and become the most respected company in that space. And so early on, as we started doing these acquisitions, we took in a little bit of angel capital to effectuate that, to be able to build the capability we needed to do in order to do that. Um, as you begin to bring that on, one of the responsibilities you have that if you're going to be a great business, you have to take care of your investors, right? And investors need liquidity at certain points, right? Um, and so as we went through that process, we just used it as capital, right? We used it absolutely as an accelerator, right? Not only capital to fuel the business, but also to bring other people around the table that were great and could teach us to build an even greater business, right? But it was never about the capital itself. Um, it was about we have a vision for what we want to create. We have a strategy and how do we effectuate that strategy? You know what? We need to fund it. Um, and how do we execute on that? And you were, it seems like you were able to stay at the helm through the whole, through lots of different financing changes. And, um, you know, I imagine it probably required a lot of effort to make sure that the, you know, you, with, with new financing, you've got new stakeholders and yeah. to keep those stakeholders aligned. So were you always, were, were you in charge of that relationship? Was that, did that fall to you as the CEO? I was, yeah, for 16 years. And, I, you know, I, I'm fortunate in that and I enjoy that a lot. Um, to, to me, to align people is there's a fun element of that. Um, but I had some great mentors around me that taught me how to do that. I had a board member uh, for 10 years. Um, that was really a mentor of mine. He had run three different public companies. He had run four different venture or private equity backed, you know, smaller businesses. I had just a phenomenal career and he was a mentor to me in learning how to do that. In fact, going back to mistakes I've made, I remember one of the invest, the very first institutional investor that I had, 
for about the first two years, I just struggled because I didn't get it and how to manage it right. And I made some mistakes. And after two years, cracked the nut and I, I love them now. Like I would definitely, you know, work with them again. Um, but, you know, totally on me and how I managed them up front. I, I didn't necessarily get it. And and I had a lot of growing up to do. Um, but, um, you know, the, Michael, the uh, the board member I was talking about and the investors were gracious and working through that. And a lot of it is figuring out different people's styles, right? Different investors. I went through three different institutional investors, um, all wildly different styles, all want different things. So you learn about the personalities, you learn about the styles, you learn about the different modes of operation. And it's also important as a CEO that you don't just take on any capital and become whatever you want. You've got to have that vision and keep going. It's when that comes out of sync and you choose the wrong investor or you bring in somebody that doesn't see it or doesn't buy it. You've got to manage that proactively and get the organization to a point of alignment because without alignment, you're just going to fall apart. Whether you're talking about your team, you're talking about your board, you're talking about your investor relationships, you've got to have your alignment or you spend time on things that you shouldn't be spending your time on. Yeah, yeah, I think that that rings very true. So I, I want to change directions for a moment. Um, I think that Chat GPT came out. Wh when did it come out? But in mid this year. Or so, so I think you were you had already November. exited. Yeah, it was right before I exited, but it became popular right as I. So I January one, I stepped down. Uh, the first two weeks of January, I, my wife and I went to the Holy Land, and then I came back to this craze of, oh my gosh, AI is happening, and it was all about Chat GPT. Um, so it was really the first quarter into the second quarter of the year where the growth and just the spurt with Chat GPT was hitting the mark. So, so I, I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is on this. Um, I've talked to some CEOs, and I and I like to ask, how are you using AI yeah. in your business? Um, well, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a funny question because I was I was on the sidelines for a big part of that growth curve, and so I'll tell you, there's a huge benefit that I had because for the first time in 16 years, right as ChatGPT was hitting. I didn't have the blinders of a business on. And what I mean by the blinders of the business is I didn't even realize that while I was operating at Three Pillar, I knew what was going on in the world. It was out there. I could feel it. I was even incorporating it into our business strategy. But my focus was so intense that I couldn't really digest it for what it was worth. But sitting and having a break, just spending time with friends and family in the first quarter of the year watching this happen... I was able to, in a very neutral position, just watch and observe. And ultimately, uh, right, my real impetus was I, I wanted to stay on the sidelines until my daughter got married in July. She got married in July. Well, two weeks later, I started a business to be in this AI space um, because what I realized was there's been a lot of trends before it. This is by far the biggest invention in all of humanity, right? All of history. And it has the potential to either help us elevate as a society and as human beings and to be more human, or it has the ability to undermine our humanity and turn us into robots, right? I don't think we're going extinct, right? I'm not one of those, but I do think it can really undermine the humanity of the world. And I wanted to be in that space. I wanted to help craft what the vision of what the future of the world looked like. So how am I using it, right? Tactically, we're using it all the time to increase personal productivity. But when you step back, the business is built on the theory that what we're using AI for today is just pure execution. How do I do my work faster? My, how does my team do more work through the computer, get us 80% of the way there, and then we finish it, right? We see those use cases of software engineering, writing content, medical research, where I think the actual impact is going to come, and especially for professional services companies, I know a lot of your listeners are professional services, is running the operations of our business, okay? How do we coordinate work? How do we cross-functionally collaborate? How do we know what to do and that it's the highest impact? How do we plan and prioritize our time? AI is phenomenal at connecting dots and dots that you and I don't always see, it can see and connect. And it's also phenomenal at finding the signal and the noise. How do you actually look at all those dots and find what's really important, what we should do? Operationally, there's huge impact there. And so at Knownwell, what we're doing, we're building an intelligent operating system for running professional services organizations. And how do you put your customer at the center of 
your operations as a business, not based on what you think, but what on you know about the business. So looking at all the natural information flows of the business and boiling that down to intelligence that says, this is what we should be executing on. And this is why we should be executing on it. And then giving you the tools to actually do it and to put it into motion. Okay. So for your new company, for known well, um, where would that fit in to the business? Like, look, would that be the chief operating officer is going to find a lot of good use out of that or the CFO yeah. or all of the above? Yeah. So um, you said it right. That the chief operator is what we're calling the ideal persona. Now, you know, especially in the middle market, not everybody has a COO, um, but if you do, it's probably them. What it is, is the individual responsible for running the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Now, the very first use case we found, we have found that especially professional services organizations, but all organizations are struggling, especially in this economy. Number one pain point is customer churn. How do I retain the clients that I have? And how do I know if they're going to churn? And how do I get ahead of that and know the reasons why? Right now, that is all done based on gut. A leader sits in the center of multiple conversations, has multiple data points, and senses something feels wrong with the relationship of a client. And they may know more, they may know less, but it's all based on that. And it's subjective opinions of what do we think. What we're able to do is take our intelligent operating system and take all of the emails, the Slack messages, the video recordings from conference calls with videos, combine that with your CRM data, combine that with publicly available information about the executives that left or your stock price, and infer judgments on here's who's at risk and here's why and here's what you should do about it. So you can see in a professional services organization, and maybe your chief delivery officer, your chief service officer, your chief operating officer, your president, um, it could be a chief customer officer. Title doesn't matter. It's the individual responsible for ultimately that client delivery. That's really fascinating. So you got right to the question that I wanted to, to know, which is what data is going to feed into the tool yep. in order to really help start generating that type of insight. And it sounds yeah. like all kinds of data, all customer, customer facing data, employee data. And it's not only all kinds of data. Here's the thing is as organizations, we are focused on data right now and we're spending millions of dollars and years of time putting together these modern data stacks, putting them, in the, putting them in, you know, Snowflake, all of our data, doing this data engineering, then putting BI solutions on top. The problem is that those are reactive solutions. I have to know what I'm looking for, then go look for it and find it. Or I have to look at generic charts and figure out what they mean to me, right? The data actually shows, this is fascinating to me, 91% of CEOs will say, that the access to data they have is actually eroding their decision-making because they don't know what to pay attention to, right? Fascinating, mind-blowing. It's because we have too much. What the AI can do is take the 80% of the information that we're not even looking at yet, right? In, in those BI implementations and data stacks, what do we have? We have the structured data that's already in ERP systems that we're doing reporting. We're just trying to blend silos together. We're doing all of this work to only look at that data, yet all of these emails, all of these video conference calls, all of the Slack channels have so much more richer tone, sentiment, and, and rationale that we're not even looking at. And we can't figure out how to turn into action turn into insights and execution, but that's where the rich data is. And so that's where we're really focused is bringing these worlds together, but then having the AI do the work for you. So it's not reactive and I have to know what to go look for. And I have to go stand up a new stack. No, let us just digest your information. We'll tell you what's important and what you should be paying attention to. I think that's fantastic. I, I want to, um, I'll put a link to, to the, your new company in the show notes and, you know, we'll, we'll share some information about this. And I'm, I'm really interested in following along as, as your company it grows. And, and is, is it is the software publicly available now? Is it is it still in development? It, it's, it, it's in early access right now. So we um, we are working with a small handful of customers uh, to, to actively build this. And we're, you know, talking to others that are interested in slowing coming on, on board uh, with us as we build it. So, okay. So now I want to ask one other question about AI, um, which I, I, I try to ask most of the CEOs that I talk to. Have you seen any layoffs or um, have you have you had to undertake any layoffs due to the fact that AI is 
creating so much more productivity. Um, mm-hmm. Has that, have you observed any of that firsthand? You know, I, so I've seen, I, I was working with one organization that was trying to wrestle with AI, the impact on their business. And they actually had a lot of content writers and they had, if I remember correctly, like 60 content writers. And they had a projection that within about a year's worth of time, as they taught the organization how to use the generative AI, they could get that down to a team of eight or something like that. It's probably the most stark example that I've seen. Um, but I'll I'll tell you, here's what's interesting about the job conversation to me. Two data points for you. Number one, if you and I were to back up and have a conversation five years ago, we would have been talking about blue collar workers and how we were worried about those that needed the jobs the most, right? Today, where are we? We're not, we're dying for no plumbers. We want more electricians, right? Um, what we're talking about is knowledge workers, not blue collar workers. So look at how quickly things change, right? So there's always these flashpoints of fear, but look how quickly things change. Data point number one. Data point number two, go back at every single point of innovation in the history of the world. There is always job displacement. There will be situations like the writers, But I love the meme. It's very cliche. And I think it's very true. AI isn't taking your job. The person that learns how to use AI is taking your job. And the jobs will change. But we now have a need for people to prompt engineer this artificial intelligence. That concept didn't even exist last year, right? There will be new jobs created at the same time. And so, yes, is it disrupting our workforce? Absolutely. But... I really do think that while the productivity and the efficiency is going up, there's a lot more value that's going to be created. Humans always, always find plenty of work to do because they love to have purpose. They love to have meaning. They love to be creative and productive. And we were made to work. So we'll find work to do. And we will do things that are even more humanizing, things that are unique to us and what we can do. I'm fully confident in that. Yeah, I I agree with that. And when it comes to your example about the content writers, I've observed that myself where content writers, yes, there have been some that have been displaced. Um, I think the cause in the future of that is going to be a little different. I think that, you know, content is valuable in many ways or has been valuable because it's been produced by people. And as a lot of certain types of content, I think are going to be less valuable, you know, Mm -hmm. other types will be more valuable. You know, there will be instructional content and tutorial content. And, and, you know, there there will be many types of content that AI will excel in creating and, and there'll be much more of that, but the value of certain types of content, I think is going to change simply because we're going to believe that most of the content we see, as soon as we see it, we're going to think, it's if if we think it's AI generated, you know, we're going to look at it differently than if we yep. thought that it was human generated. And yeah. I think that's going to lead to a, a decrease in demand for certain types of content. Yeah, I, I think that is totally true. And I'll say, here's what goes along with that that you just made me think of. There's another brand new job, right? We used to be have within the world of content, we used to have publishers, and Mm -hmm. editors who are responsible for compiling and aggregating content and bringing it to the world. You just described a world that is inside out, that instead of all content being valuable, all of a sudden we have to discern what content's valuable. Will we, instead of publishers and editors have filters, right? Individuals who use human judgment to figure out what is valuable and unique and what is not, right? I don't know, but that's just the type of idea that the world is changing so much. I love how you framed that of this inside out world. We've got to think backwards about everything. Very interesting. Yeah. I think we're, we're headed for a lot of change. I mean, that much we know. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, is there anything about being CEO the sec- so so how many times have you been CEO now? This is your second time or This is my second run, yeah. So how how is that different so far? Well, you know, I'll tell you what's interesting is um there is something about having done it before and you know, I am in inning 1 of a 9 inning game where I played 16 innings before, right? So to be able to go back to the beginning, um 
I'm energized and I'm fresh in a way that I haven't in a while. Um, but I have the playbook. Like I've played the game before. Have you ever learned a new board game? And the first time you're, you know, you're playing with your cards open on the table and everybody's looking and you're kind of fuddling your way through. There's something about that that feels right about that analogy in this situation where I can see around more corners and I'm really enjoying being able to focus on the unique things I can do to bring value versus just figuring out stuff that I should have known in the first point. Um, and so I'm having a blast. I think the other thing that's a little bit different is I'm further in my career and, you know, I don't have to do everything myself. I've been able to surround myself with a team, uh, you know, at three pillar, the first two and a half years, I think I did the books and, you know, ask the auditors how well that went the very first time I had an audit, right? This time I won't have to deal with that. So there are a couple of things just practically that are different that um, I know, I know what to build, how to build. I've got the tools, the templates that I've been able to bring with me after, after building those the hard way uh, the first time around. So yeah, not doing the books yourself. That sounds like a big difference. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can relate to that one. Is there, is there anything that you, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of CEOs think about what they would do if they had a blank sheet of paper in front of them, you know, they're just starting out after nope. years of experience and, you know, having all that history is both good and bad. You've got baggage from it and yep. then you start brand new. Is there anything with your, you know, now that you've got this blank sheet of paper, is there anything notable that you absolutely thought to yourself, all right, I'm definitely not doing it the same way. I'm definitely changing. Yeah. Let me give you an example of, of one of each. So I walked you through before how I think about business, very simply ideology, strategy, operating system, management system. Okay. So at the beginning of known well, I decided, you know what? I built that playbook. I spent time at the beginning of the year refining it, thinking about it. What did I do wrong? And I created this framework that I said, exactly what you just said. I'm going to put this playbook to use. Well, I went in and I think what we have done in our first three months for ideology and strategy have been awesome and have accelerated us and created focus and alignment like you can't even believe. And I definitely didn't have that maturity the, the first time around. That said, I tried to apply the same thinking to the operating system and the management system. And I imposed, um, I don't know, three weeks in this new management system that I was going to use that I had learned the hard way um, was the right way to run a business that was data oriented and instilled discipline and rigor into the business. And you know what? It was too much for a startup. It was appropriate for when we had 2000 people at three pillar, but it was too much within three, three weeks. My team was like, what are, what are we doing? This is kind of a waste of time. Like we're not this mature. So we pulled the plug, right? Um, I think I'm a lot more confident now in pulling the plug and saying, okay, maybe this applies at one phase of the journey, but not this phase. Interestingly enough, just this morning, I was having a virtual coffee with a, with a friend of mine who's a serial entrepreneur as well. He's actually run, I think, seven businesses. Um, and he was saying something very similar. Like he's really learned that yes, there's a toolkit, but there are different points in the life cycle for pulling out the tools. Um, you don't use every single one at every single phase. And I think I've learned that in the last you know few months in a way that I did not expect. David, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Were there any topics that we didn't cover that you were hoping we would get to today? Man, this was just a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me and um, I'm really excited to continue uh, to, to collaborate and find ways to work together. Well, thanks again. This has been fantastic.